So today we're going to do, a, I'm going to do a quick presentation on a major theme that we're seeing in the mining industry, um, uh, the uh, environmental, social and government's uh, uh, criteria that uh, uh, major investors are using to determine what stocks and sectors they actually invest in and the impacts on mining. So without further ado, uh, I'll start with my presentation on ESG and mining. So what we'll go through is the attraction uh, basically on general investors to ESG, how uh, the mega mergers, you know, were executed to attract these generalist investors. Who are these generalist investors? ESG principles. Uh, and what we're going to see is that actions speak louder than words here. And then what we see the thematic here is that is mining is the mining industry investable. And then what we see in terms of how they rate and rank, you know, because a lot of these projects use a lot of power, you know, that ability to access clean power, such as in places like Canada, has a significant impact on emissions and your carbon footprint. And then the other thing for us in the junior world, how will it impact investment decisions or M&A? So uh, in the letter that I put out uh, annually for uh, for subscribers in 2020, one of the thematics that I introduced was, you know, this idea of reduction of the global emission of greenhouse gases. So the metals that were exposed to that were the metals that I wanted to be exposed to in terms of the, the companies. And then whether you're a climate change denier or Greta Thunberg, you can't ignore the amount of capital deployed for this venture in terms of the thematic. My focus was basically on the metal demand. What I basically missed was the effect on institutional equity investors and what their criteria would be. The generalist investor is one that major companies have been trying to attract and trying to gear away from the uh, from the uh, passive investing in GDX and GDXJ, those sort of things, ETFs. And so part of that attraction, you will have to also meet their criteria of uh, ESG requirements. And that's what we're seeing now. It appears right now, looking at how we're benchmarking, there's probably a lot more work to do for mining companies to appease some of these uh, uh, institutions. So if we look a bit of the background, attracting the generalists away from passive uh, ETFs. We saw several years ago, Barrick acquisition of Rangold, Newmont purchase of Gold Corp, and then the consolidation of both their asset bases in Nevada to what we know now as Nevada Gold Mines. The whole idea there was uh, higher liquidity, which would attract the generalists, you know, better margins by reducing corporate GNA, optimization of portfolio. We saw a lot of divestments. And then that all that generates is focus on free cash flow generation. And you can see that from the cumulative free cash flow that Barrick um, um, had made from uh, 2019 to 2021. And then also um, the better balance sheets, the, the reduction of net debt. And then all the, that leads into better dividends. And that's one thing not a lot of ETFs can actually pay out our dividends. And that's a big attraction to the generalists. So now you're attracting generalists into the sector. Who exactly are you attracting? So the generalists do not focus on any specific sector, but exposure to sectors that fit their macro investment theme, whatever it happens to be. You know, and they could take major positions in large companies, you know, four to eight percent. They need liquidity so they can come in and out. And these new mega mergers have given them that liquidity. And these institutional investors come from North America, US, Canada, Europe. And at one point they had about 28 trillion in assets under management. So a significant sum and all these mining companies are asking for is a proportion. And they've been signing up back in 2005. So this is a theme that's been happening for a while into this principles of responsible investment, which also includes the idea of ESG. And it sort of reflects the growing relevance among institutional funds for this type of practice that basically drives some of their criteria for investing. So BlackRock, you know, one of the large uh, uh, macro uh, generalist funds, you know, uh, has about six trillion or more in assets under management, has been looking at investment through an ESG lens for over a decade. 
Okay, and so what are ESG principles? The ones we focus in on is the environmental, and this, this is easy to quantify. Anybody with a technical report or an operation can tell you their, their emissions, you know, based on what they're using uh, for fuel. Uh, most, you know, trucks use uh, diesel, where they're getting their power from. And so it's not just that they get power off the grid. Where does the power from the grid come from? Our use of water and the waste, high strip ratio, that sort of thing. Um, safety has always been important on, on the social side for mining. It's a reflection of efficiency. Diversity is new in terms of trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, put that into, uh, uh, into the uh, mining company's um, uh, thinking. That might be easier from the corporate perspective, doing it at, at the, you know, where, where the company's based and maybe more difficult at site, depending on uh, the communities, local communities and that. And then the other thing, obviously, is community relations. I would, I would say that companies, mining companies, have been in the business of, uh, you know, advocating for good community relationships for a while, because if they do not have good communi uh, community relationships, you do, they cannot proceed with the development of any kind of project. In terms of governance, we are seeing some transition to more independence and diversity, but more from the major companies, what we need to see that a little bit more from the junior companies, and then also compensation policies. Those are basically some of the major things that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the companies that are basing their investment on ESG criteria are looking for. And so ESG benchmarking is something new. So we can't take everything people are saying, you know, uh, as, as the truth, because everybody's using different metrics. It has yet to be very well standardized, um, like, you know, when the World Gold Council put out, you know, all in sustaining costs and just said, OK, this is the way you do it. That's not the case right now with ESG. It's a benchmark scale. It's relative. This was done by Sustain Analytics. And what they're showing you basically is gold companies score very poorly on the metric that they're imposing. You know, uh, so if you were an ESG investor, you know, you, you might shy away from the entire industry, even if you were attracted to the sector. So why would you do that? You know, because uh, we know that uh, operating trucks uses diesel. You can do electrification if you're close to power. You know, um, you know, companies can use heavy fuel oil to operate power plants versus the grid power. But then the question is, if you do have grid power, is it coal, is it gas powered, or is it hydro or nuclear? You know, that would impact your emissions. The treatment of water in remote regions, that would impact waste rock, is it acid generating? And this is something different for gold versus base metals or any uh, product, product that requires further refining. And so the metrics don't stop at the mine site. So if you produce gold, uh, which a lot of companies do produce, with, which would be um, the actual refined end product, you know, there's no knock-on impact with further freight, smelting, and refining to get you that fungible product. Gold companies have that advantage. Whereas copper companies, nickel companies, you know, these other ones that produce concentrates, they will still be imposed the impact of freight, smelting, refining, uh, you know, to get to that sale of product, those ESG impacts will be will be put on that mine or that project. So that's something you also you got to think about. So it's not only that you're thinking about, oh, you know, hey, we've got hydropower at our mine site, but if you're sending it to a smelter in China that you know derives its power by coal, that would also impact your ESG score. So if you can see what the social and Governance impacts, you know, there's talk about occupational risk, safety, but again, safety in that is something embedded in mining that mining companies do a good job on, more so than I would say a lot of companies. Their problem is local workforce diversity, depending on the communities they have and trying to advocate them. And if you look at the, the lower right there with respect to Newmont, you know, they, they do a good job of, um, you know, diversity or female represent representation on the board of directors, 
But, you know, depending on the community, they have a harder time of getting that uh, type of maybe local or indigenous representation, depending where they are. You know, so sometimes it's not the company's fault. It's just where they are, you know, uh, and, and training and all that that they try to do with respect to uh, getting that project um, in production and, and um, working efficiently. The other problem is corruption. And so that could deal with uh, the country that you're operating in as well and so if you look at these scores and this was done by scar and associates who are um, who are trying to implement a system uh, that companies can use uh, scope one is at the mine site scope two is taking into account everything else that you might do but you could see from this if you look at versus commodity uh, you know in terms of the first level uh, in terms of companies, I mean, uh, what you do from um, emissions or carbon dioxide equivalent emissions by commodity to first saleable product, if you just look at, at the mine site, you know, gold, you know, uh, is up there with copper, you know, more so than nickel, let's say, and metallurgical coal. But gold does not have a lot of the impacts of downstream freight, smelting and refining. You can see that primary aluminum has a big impact because of the amount of power required in, uh, in, in the aluminum industry. So that, you know, basically is, is heads and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, you know, but, but the gold's advantage right now is that it does not require the freight smelting and refining. But then gold's disadvantage is that if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, gold's not a, 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 a product that's going to help you there. Copper will, nickel will, um, and, and other um, uh, other kind of uh, commodities like that. And then if you look at this, this is a ranking of ESG from, again, the SCAR analytics where I've plotted it. And these are different companies, but you can see the range here. And what we see that the severest uh, ESG rankings, the worst, tend to be the Chinese companies that work in conditions that have you know, that aren't very safe, that um, use, uh, you know, coal or some other kind of hydrocarbon for power. Um, and those are on the very far right of this graphic. The ones that score the best here are the royalty companies, because I guess that they're not given the same kind of impacts of where those royalties are actually coming from. That could change. But right now, you know, the royalty companies score you know very low on this metric and so if you wanted exposure and you're just looking at this chart and you thought this was the the truth basically you would look maybe to get your exposure to gold through the royalty companies versus the actual mining companies so scar and associates now is you know taking a role because uh this this uh company i i used to use uh in terms of benchmarking costs then they benchmark costs by going to the roots, like you know, finding out how many barrels of diesel you use, how many kilowatts of hour uh, power you use, you know, how many megawatts, and so by that they can derive your cost. That same methodology would also get you your carbon footprint, and so this would be the E part of the ESG. And you could see that here, in terms of refined gold product, you know, versus tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and this is over uh, ounce produced, you can see that the ones on the right will still be those Chinese producers. But you can see Barrick and Newmont because uh, you know, they've got a lot of exposure to, uh, to Nevada, which uses an ultra natural gas and still there's some coal power there. And they occupy a lot of power, they mill, they, um, they, uh, they have um, autoclaves. And so they, they don't score that well on, on this metric. You know, and and, you, and if you go to your left, you know, the ones that score really well, like you can see Agnico scores very well, Pretium scores remarkably well, uh, it, because they're in Canada where they're exposed to hydropower. So you can see that if there's any kind of, um, you know, um, a strategic push to uh, diversify and, and uh, lower your score, there might be an incentive there to look at assets that could actually mitigate your ESG score, especially your carbon footprint. 
So that's something else to think about when you're thinking about, oh, is my project or my company a takeover target? So if we follow the money, uh, we can see that now ESG, environmental sustainability and governments, like if we look at Newmont, takes up a significant part, 30% of the short-term incentive plan for executives. And so if that is the case, and that pervades the industry in terms of the companies that would potentially be the suitors for your junior, then that could impact their investment decisions. That could impact which assets they buy. You know, choosing projects with smaller greenhouse gas emissions may be in the end an important criteria if they want to maintain their generalist investor base. So again, actions speak louder than words. And what have we seen from the big diversified miners? We've seen, uh, you know, over the past several months, BHP, the second largest mining company, has shifted its oil and gas assets into a joint venture. And how that worked is they basically split the equity. And so somebody can own BHP without having exposure to the oil and gas because they can sell out of that company and just own BHP. With respect to tech, a Bloomberg article recently came out that now they're looking to spin out or sell uh, their metal metallurgical coal business. And this is not a business that has been losing them money recently. This is 35% of their profits in 2020. They produce a significant amount of met coal, uh, 21 million tons from four sites in Western Canada. But their whole idea is shifting focus to copper. And, and, and as we can see, as, as are many of the other diversified miners. And then a, a Russian uh, a, a mining company, Polymetal, um, uh, actually, no, I don't think they're Russian, actually. But they've agreed to a $400 million dollar sustainability linked financing and this might be a new form of funding that we can see but then the imposition would be of maintaining these ESG criteria carbon footprint on the operation and the banks would basically lend to you and there's money that will go into these funds to raise capital for projects like this and so people are trying to tap that as well but what we have to know is that you have to really understand that your, uh, your project would have a very low footprint. And so all of this, again, driving investment ideas, investment, um, what you're going to do going forward, and also you know, how you raise capital. Okay, so basically summary, impacts of these generalist funds, are in the gold sector and other mining sectors that we've seen is now synchronizing their investment criteria. Uh, these generalist funds control a significant amount of, uh, uh, of capital uh, and uh, their ESG principle, principles are now being, uh, uh, being applied to uh, mining companies, more, some more so than others. You know, like I said, safety was always an issue. Community relations was always important. Diversity is becoming much more important as well as carbon footprint. Again, right now with the first scores that are coming out, the mining industry doesn't score that well. Diesel consumption, wastewater, power. But you know, some of these metals that we mine are the metals that have to be used to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to look at the fact that you know, uh, if we don't produce these metals, we might not be have we might not have these medium to long term impacts on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Gold companies, uh, their thing is that uh, they don't have that, let's say, material offset with what they produce, but they also don't have that additional smelting, refining, freight issue because most of them produce the fungible product at the mine. These new ratings that we see, royalty companies tend to perform better. Than the, than the operating mines, especially on the right-hand side, the Chinese gold firms uh, that basically use uh, uh, these um, uh, coal-fired plants or other carbon uh, uh, plants, uh, and then they have um, their safety issues. Uh, companies are actively linking their management's incentive plan with ESG principles, and so that's one way of following the money in terms of how these in investment decisions will be made. And then the question is, will companies with large carbon footprints, you know, and 
community issues is a given because if you've got big community issues, you're not going to, nothing's going to happen with you. But if you have a big carbon footprint, will you be at the top of the list with respect to potential suitors, uh, despite your production profile and despite your all in sustaining cost, uh, which might be in the lower quartile. So in summary, the impacts of ESG principles is something we should think about even if we're junior investors, because this will trickle down. Um, uh, to all of us with respect to mid-tiers, juniors, uh, and, and how we invest and where we draw capital from.